lowering the age of consent, as it's called. Uh, even uh, there, is, there was a tendency, which I think is now being arrested, uh, to look upon rape in the courts uh, as justifying only quite light punishments. So that, I feel, that last point is an indication of how out of control things can become. Since then, there has been so much row over these light punishments that things are changing. But it's amazing how human beings, once they're on the move in a direction, can go to such extremes. And I really feel, of course, in the light of Buddhism, that is, isn't it, the devilish power of life of working people. Not consciously, but subconsciously. And this uh, really was encouraging control of the situation to become very weak. And there have been lots of other examples in history. I just jotted down a few. Uh, that we saw, for instance, in the Bible, the prophets uh, of Israel, you know, exhorting the children of Israel not to fall prey to pagan religions, you know, Sodom and Gomorrah and all that. Some of you may have heard of it. Uh, also, in our own history here, uh, the uh, beheading of King Charles I and the Cromwell's regime uh, as a, a sort of dictator, really, benevolent dictator, but nevertheless a dictator, this was all to do with the moral atmosphere of the country. In other words, there was a Puritan movement which was uh, opposite, totally opposite to the way in which the country was going at that time. And they wanted to arrest it on religious grounds and create a Puritan movement to take its place. Or if you look at uh, the Nazi regime, uh, uh, Hitler, once things began to go against him, uh, began to relax all the sort of moral attitudes which were instilled at the beginning of that regime on the grounds of creating this master Aryan race which was going to rule the world. And there was quite tight moral control at the beginning in order to create this great race of sort of superhumans. But when things began to get difficult, all those restrictions were let go and immorality really began to run wild uh, in amongst the people and the officials of the Nazi regime. So in the end, of course, it's the people in power who have manipulated the human beings, knowing the weakness that exists within them through the animal instincts which are part of life, the desires that we talk about. And uh, evil politicians and statesmen have used that in order to control the people. So perhaps the greatest example was, was Rome, this great Roman Empire which was so huge and so powerful eventually, finally disintegrated completely because in order to please the people, in order to keep them supporting these great armies, in order to encourage people to fight in those armies, uh, there was a gradual relaxing of morality. And that relaxation of morality ate particularly into the group of people who were in power. And finally, because of that relaxing of morality, Rome collapsed. So it's a battle, this battle between the animal and the enlightened human being has been going on ever since time began, as I said earlier on. So really, in the end, permissiveness, total permissiveness, I really feel and agree with these authors that it, it, it arises when people begin to lose their, their hope for the future or their ideals for the future. 
This can be for a number of reasons. It may be uh, that uh, too much material wealth, for example, can put people's minds too much on the here and now and make them forget those ideals. There are all sorts of different reasons why that may happen. But certainly, I think it's true that total permissiveness to all people losing control of their lives, basically, and being encouraged to do so because the same thing is going on amongst those who are in power over them. This happens when a nation or a people lose their great ideal. So in the case of this country, uh, the loss of the old ideal of the British Empire, wrong as it may have been, that British people could bring peace and security you know, everywhere in the world. And they did succeed to some extent, but of course it had the problem of, uh, to some extent, oppression, a lack of freedom on the part of other people, uh, which eventually you know, came to a head and the British Empire collapsed. So it may have had a great ideal behind it, uh, but in the end, uh, that ideal was lost because people rather more used the British Empire for exploitation, for gaining great wealth and so on, and its original ideals disappeared. And once that happens, once people have lost an altruistic ideal, then corruption steps in, doesn't it? And that corruption is not only from one person to another, but it's also the person within himself or herself becomes corrupted. And the whole movement weakens. So at this point, it would be good to hear what Nishun Daishonin says in the Risho Ankokuron about this very situation. What he is saying, of course, in the Risho Ankokuron is that because of false teachings or teachings that were corrupting the minds of the people, their life force was being sapped. So as you know, at that time in Japan, the most popular, grow fast growing religion was known as Nembutsu. And Nembutsu was really saying to people, you know, this life is grim anyway. But if you chant, and, and you can't do anything about it, but if you chant Nam Amida Butsu, uh, then definitely you'll go to this great paradise, the great Western, pure Western land, as it was called, after you die. So this life is just a life of suffering. There's nothing you can do about it. You can't change it. Uh, but when you die, then, then your time will come. So this bred apathy, it, bred, it, it, it sapped the life force of the people, it must have done. Because there was no hope in this life. They just had to put up with things as they were. And of course this was very useful for the people in power. The more people are apathetic, the more easy they are to rule or govern. So uh, I'll ask Sander now just to read some extracts. Uh, Extracts which I selected because they, they, are, they are concerning social problems rather than other sorts of problems, because this is what we're talking about today. So, from Misha and Kokoran, not a single person in the entire population will possess a heart of goodness. There will be nothing but binding and enslaving, killing and injuring, anger and contention. Men will slander each other or fawn upon one another, and the laws will be twisted until even the innocent are made to suffer. Marauders from many other regions will invade and plunder the nation. The people will suffer all manner of pain and affliction, and there will be no place where one may live in safety. The Daijuku Sutra says, when the principles of Buddhism truly become obscured and lost, then people will all let their beards, hair, and fingernails grow long, and the laws of the world will be forgotten and ignored. The ten kinds of evil behavior will increase greatly, particularly greed, anger, and stupidity, 
and people will think no more of their fathers and mothers than does the roe deer. Living beings will decline in numbers, in longevity, physical power, and enjoyment. They will become estranged from the pleasures of human and heavenly existence, and all will fall into the evil states of existence. The wicked rulers and monks who perform these ten kinds of evil behavior will destroy the true law of the Buddha and make it impossible for sentient beings to be born in the human and heavenly states of existence. At that time, the various benevolent deities and heavenly rulers who would ordinarily take pity on living beings will abandon this nation of confusion and evil and all will make their way to other regions. Thank you. So his point there is that in terms of what we now understand as practicing members of Nichiren Shoshu Buddhism, the point is that if the life force of the people is sad, and becomes exhausted because they have no means to replace it, then inevitably the forces of the universe or the Buddhist gods who we feed with our life force will react in a negative way as if they've deserted the land. So this was evident in Japan at that time because <clears throat> accompanying this social uh, deterioration were incredible natural disasters following one upon the other in the most terrifying and terrible way. So Nichiren Daishonin's point was that in the end this was all because the people lacked life force through teachings which were encouraging apathy and degradation. So in the first prayer of Gongyo we feed or we, we take it upon ourselves to concentrate our lives on those Buddhist gods or forces of the universe. And each day we renew our determination in that first prayer of Gongyo to support them with our life force. We thank them for the protection we had yesterday. We're grateful for that. But we also have to feed our life force to them <coughs> today. In this way we protect ourselves, in fact. That is the whole significance of the first prayer of Gongyo. We concentrate our whole minds and our whole lives on those protective forces represented by Bonten and Taishaku and the gods of the sun, the moon and the stars. All in tremendous influences on our lives, and there are many more. So through concentrating our lives on them, expressing our gratitude, which helps us to concentrate our life in that first prayer, we are, as it were, keying into that, those influences. Putting our lives into rhythm with them. So that in the whole of the rest of that gongyo, and ultimately, most important of all, the daimoku, they are part of our lives. And we feed them with the life force of our Buddhist practice. So Mr. Toda said, you know, it's, I... I, I always visualize it as being like uh, when I turn to face the Gahonzan after that first prayer all the forces of the universe rush in and line up on either side of me and take part in the ceremony with me beautiful isn't it so try hard to feel that connection when you're doing that first prayer of God this is how we create our own protection So the solution, and Sensei makes it clear, is life force. He mentions it quite briefly at this part, of, in this part, this section of the book. But by the time he comes to the end of the book, he's really explained everything about life force to Dr. Toynbee. That is the crucial thing. People who are filled, filled with life force, without realizing it, will be leading creative lives creating value wherever they go. People whose life force is exhausted will be apathetic and slaves to whatever the situation is in their surroundings. <coughs> so, we can't accept that our society is good and great as it stands, can we? We cannot accept that. 
There are good things in it, of course. And no one is saying that what went on before in Victorian times was good, because it wasn't. It was another extreme, in a way. Very hypocritical age. But we can't be satisfied. We have to change society. And we have to be alert to what needs changing through the wisdom of our practice. And gradually, in our own particular sphere of action, we can bring about that change. Though it may seem remote from what our daily life, in terms of our jobs, are concerned with. It may seem remote, but we're influencing people all the time without realizing it, as I said earlier on. This travels out from one person to the next. Okay, there are only 3,500 or so people practicing Nichiren Daishin's Buddhism in this country at the moment. But 3,500 people in terms of the number of people each one of those 3,500 meet in a day or in a week or in a year is an incredible influence. That's the point, isn't it? They can... They can pass on a new slant on some particular subject. Someone else to whom they spoke says, I was to someone else, I was talking to someone the other day and they pointed out this. And so it goes on. Maybe hundreds of people hear that view in the end. So one's influence is great. And as long as that influence is coming from Daimoku, from the Buddha's state, then we must be spreading that. And of course, in some cases, that, that value will be more concrete. You know, people who are chanting in the education department of a local government, for example, would actually, in the end, begin to see practical action which can be taken to improve things and to make life happier for human beings. And they can influence others who may not be practicing to support them. And so it goes on incredible human movement of ordinary people like we all are each with our own good points and our weak points the good points are always there the whole theme of sensei's poem to us which we'll study in real detail on summer course the whole theme of that poem is to point out the great good points of the people who live in this country He's saying, you know, build on those and you'll naturally want to overcome the weak points. So each in our own sphere of action, we're able to do this through this incredible practice. And of course, also through Shakabuku. Of course, always in everything we do, there is that, isn't there? That, or should be, that ultimate, ultimate desire for Shakabuku. Some people will practice, others we meet won't. But we still want their support. We still want their understanding about the greatness of this Buddhism, even though they can't practice themselves. So they move on from there uh, to talk again in more detail about mind and body. They discuss Shiki Shin Funi, which I've already explained. They talk about the way in relig religions have got things wrong. This I've mentioned. And then they go on to science. What place does science play in this matter of the conflict of the anim animal instincts and the higher instincts in human beings? And, uh, for example, they point out that in psychosomatic medicine, psychosomatic uh, uh, medicine which is growing in its influence in the world of conventional medicine, Shikishin Funi really is the principle on which it is based. That understanding that the spiritual life can cause physical ill health and vice versa. Physical ill health can of course cause spiritual ill health. And uh, always it comes back in the end to that point 
which I explained of Ku Ke Chu, Judo, that force inside us which can bind the two. So in my case, I spent 10 years trying to be a good Christian. It, it helped me to some extent some extent spiritually I felt more comfortable because I suppose I was leading a life which was a little better in terms of trying to be a good Christian but it didn't change my karma at all it didn't help me in the least to solve this problem of the conflict uh, of which one example would be the animalistic instincts in us uh, as opposed to the higher instincts so I felt a little better. It didn't change my life. Still, I must have been doing the same old things which caused, in the end, suffering to me and suffering to others. So I think that we don't grasp this point enough, this matter of ku, ke, and chu, chudo, the middle way. I don't believe we use that enough in Shakabuku. And yet it's very practical. Out of even this talk today, you know, one can see how much you can apply ku, ke, and chu to the circumstances of, and sufferings of someone you're doing Shakabuku to. If you think about it, if you try to grasp it into your life. I believe in the West especially, it's a very, very important principle in that for Shakabuku. Even if you look at things in general, you can see how absolutely out of order and out of rhythm everything is. Science is inventing more and more technological wonders. But there is no harmony in that process, is there? Human beings are advancing technologically, scientifically, but that advance is chaotic. There is no harmony or coordination between the various aspects of those developments. We see a chaotic world, don't we? Where, you know, on the one side you've got people creating out of that technology weapons of absolute ultimate destruction and on the other side of course there are people who are trying to use them for something good but it's it's chaotic this human the human race is advancing in a chaotic race uh, in a cha chaotic way in that respect so of course there are lots of people who are worried about this but they have nothing no foundation on which to base it so because they, they will all understand there is a spiritual aspect to life and there is a physical aspect to life. Everybody understands that if they think for two seconds. So all they can think of is some sort of weak, wet compromise. Those people who are disturbed and anxious. But of course, compromise will never work because it always is weak and because an awful lot of people are saying, to hell with that, I want to get on with things. So how can we get on with things and at the same time harmonize that progress? This is really the key point. And the answer is that people must become aware of the, of the great middle way, that human beings actually can find that great middle way. Though, of course, the only way that I know and the only way that you know is to tap that very heart of life itself through the power of Dhammaku. Nevertheless, we can prove through our own experiences that we have discovered the existence of Chu or Chudo. We've discovered, we know that at the heart of our lives exists the Buddha state or Namyo Rengeki. The binding force, the power to bring together <coughs> physical activities of humankind and the spiritual activities and harmonize them so that the world can grow dynamically and expand or civilization can expand dynamically 
but at the same time in harmony. This is what is needed to replace the chaos which we see going on everywhere, isn't it? Are you all with me there? So it is a point to ponder, isn't it, for Shakabuku? Especially when you're involved in talking about social matters rather than just purely individual problems. Everywhere you look in society, you see this chaos. Architects, well, the Prince of Wales has been having a go of them recently, but architects building great buildings at enormous expense which don't take into consideration the needs and the happiness of the human beings who are going to use them. This is another example of the same thing, isn't it? All sorts of examples. We see that this often in the way bus drivers and train drivers and guards and things ignore the happiness of the people who they're driving. And that's usually because the management is not looking after them and the thing becomes a chain reaction of disharmony. People drive roads through you know, beautiful areas. That's the cheapest way. But it may not be the best way for the people who live in those areas and the animals and birds and insects who inhabit it. Doctors are a good example too. I think that trend is beginning to change now in the medical profession, but doctors were just becoming sort of pill-giving machines, weren't they? I mean, like pressing a button almost. No concern often with the human being. This is beginning to change. Doctors are really becoming so aware of it, but it's taken a whole lot of suffering to bring them to that point. So in every area of society, certainly, this chaos exists. So finally, they talk about the subconscious and the makeup of one's life or mind. And I, I think you've all got a little handout which explains those nine consciousnesses which Buddhism teaches. And it isn't my place today to give a lecture on that. But if you read that carefully and think about it, it becomes very clear, I think, of the interaction within one's life of the various layers of consciousness and subconsciousness. And of course, it, above all things, points out that you have to find a way to tap the ninth consciousness. The ninth consciousness, which is the Buddha consciousness, or the universal uh, consciousness universal wisdom. So you have to tap that so that that harmonizing force works in all the other layers until it's working literally, you know, in one's fingertips and the, the senses, in one's taste, in one's hearing, everything. That theory makes that very clear. And this is another thing that for some people when you do shakabuku uh, can be a very meaningful thing, the existence of those nine consciousnesses. So don't put it aside and say, oh, that sounds horribly psychological and I don't understand it. Just, you know, think about it, the reaction of these various layers of consciousness, how they work. And there is a good explanation in the Buddhism of the sun. I think it says that there is a note to that effect if you want to grasp it even more. Even in that world of the subconscious, they talk about uh, super, super normality or things like miracles. And Sensei says clearly, you know, Buddhism would say there is no such thing as a miracle. There is no such thing as super normality. Everything is normal because everything is subject to the law of cause and effect. So of course sometimes the cause and the effect may be somewhat rare, not something that you encounter every day, but still in the end it is cause and effect and it is therefore a normal uh, happening 
in terms of life itself. So ghosts and all the rest of it you know, are interesting things. People always get excited when one mentions ghosts. What is a ghost? It is a, it is a normal happening in terms of cause and effect within a person's life which projects through the senses an actual image. So everything is explained and no such thing as miracles exist. But you have to think that one out for yourself. But it's, this, this is what Buddhism is saying. ghosts are the workings of one's mind. Then you come to things like telepathy. Telepathy is a normal ability that exists in human beings, sensei say. If you know the Australian Aboriginals, or if you've ever read books about them, you realize that there are still people in this world whose lives are pure enough to use telepathy every day in their daily life. Aboriginals in Australia can spread themselves with a mile or two between each person across the Australian desert searching for the roots that they live on, especially during the, the, the hottest season. And they, they communicate by telepathy. When the time comes for everyone to go home, because it's getting late and they've got to have a meal of some sort, they'll all turn round. They can't see each other. Maybe two miles between them and the next person. But they know. They communicate with each other. It exists in us all. It's been lost because of the pressures of modern life and because of our reliance, particularly on material things. But it exists in everybody. That's what Buddhism is saying. There is nothing unusual about tele telepathy. It is a perfectly normal function of life and of the relationship between people. And of course, if there is an impediment in that relationship, if there's a blockage, then it won't work. If there is a desire for harmony between one person, another, or a group of people amongst each other, telepathy will work. But you've got to, of course, prove it for yourself to believe it. Clairvoyance or fortune tellers, if they're really genuine, can understand karma or the pattern of cause and effect that they can see in someone's life. They may do it by diagrams and all sorts of calculations. Uh, they may do it just out of feeling. If they're really genuine, if they're really people who are deeply concerned about the happiness of another person, then they'll be able to do that. But on the other hand, they can only do it as they see it at that moment. So in terms of this Buddhism, you never want to waste money going to see them. Because by tomorrow, your karma will be different. Because you chant Nam Yore No one has no idea really it's difficult to see how fast one's karma is changing we only see the big things the dramatic things but our karma is changing in a thousand small ways every day which we can't even see we think having a nice day with nothing awful happening is normal but you may have changed karma from yesterday through your great gongyo that morning though you've no idea on the surface of life, isn't it? So please don't waste your money. What they say today, in a week's time, could be totally different. And I'm not saying this just off the back of my nut. I've discussed this with really reliable clairvoyance. They all live. They have to judge it on what is there at that moment that you see them or talk. Beyond that, it's impossible to judge. So 
Now the best form of clairvoyant is the gonzo. Please understand. Same with all other things in that field. Those weights that you dangle on a bit of string. I've forgotten their name. What? Dowsers. Well, it depends on the person who's doing it. If that person truly desires to be able to help you to be happy, if the dowsing is from the Bodhisattva state, in other words, then at that particular moment in time they could say something. But tomorrow it may be out of date, if you're chanting to the gods. Completely out of date. And it's important to understand this, because of course, uh, even the best intention of clairvoyant and so on could create some thought in one's mind which can actually stick there and influence you. It can hold up you changing your karma because it's influencing your mind. Well, this is a very important point. So in other words, truly speaking, to, to rely on clairvoyance or fortune telling or dowsing or whatever is a form of slander. It's putting that first in front of the gongs, isn't it? I wanted to say that because I don't want you to waste your money. And sometimes these things can be really expensive. But they move on finally to reason and intuition. I think there's no need to go into that in too much detail, and time is already running over the top. But really, Sensei is pointing out in so many words that there are two ways we can, we can deal with problems, or things that we've got to ponder and understand. One is the analytical way, which is the way which is mostly used in the West, where we start from the outside, the problem or what we want to discover is in the middle and by a process of analysis, deduction, we hope we can reach the middle. That's how scientists do it. There is another way which is the more oriental way which is inductive. That is to say you start at the center and then you work your way outwards. Do you follow? So, uh, Nichiren Daishonin, if you study the Gosho, uses both. This is why it's amazing. He doesn't, although he was an Oriental, he doesn't just use the inductive form. In other words, this is, this is the realization, and you can come to it gradually this way. He uses both. You'll find if you study the Gosho that he approaches analytically and he approaches the thing inductively. Do you follow what I'm getting at? This is amazing. And it's because of this that Sensei says there must be reason and intuition. And Toynbee points out that even scientists always begin with a hypothesis. You all know what a hypothesis is. It's a, it's a hypo hypothesis. <coughs> it, it, it is, um, what's the English word? It's um, a theory or, a, or a, an idea. Hmm? But it's actually, as, as Toynbee points out, and Sensei of course agrees, it's actually something intuitive, isn't it? It's an intuitive feeling that this could be the explanation for something that exists or is happening. The scientist starts with that hypothesis and then he tries to prove it factually by investigation. So, interestingly enough, even scientists who despise things spiritual so far as pure science is concerned, even they are beginning with something that is intuitive coming from the depths of their lives. It's interesting, isn't it? So, of course, 
the conclusion is that the more scientists chant nam myoho renge the more likely those hypotheses will be great and will really lead to important developments in science because they will, the hypothesis will be coming from their Buddha wisdom. You following my argument? How many scientists here? Come on. Any sort of scientist. Medical. <laughs> Don't be shy. Okay. Good. So even there in science, uh, wisdom is needed, of course. And science will then progress in a more harmonious way. So I, I must really stop now. But uh, maybe as a final remark in that connection, as you know, in Nichiren Daishonin's Buddhism, there is no such thing as blind faith. The other religions are losing ground because in this scientific material age, people cannot believe in miracles. They can't believe, for example, in the virgin birth. They can't believe that Jesus rose from the dead. And I don't blame them. I couldn't, I, I couldn't believe it either. And that's why, in the end, I had to give up Christianity, because there was no logical explanation. And even as a little boy, I suppose I had a, a mind which was infuriating to, to, to teachers, but I said to one teacher, you know, why did Jesus cry out on the cross, Father, Father, why hast thou forsaken me? Something, even as a boy of nine or ten, I think I was, that worried me. How can Jesus' beliefs be great if that's what he called out from the cross? Something went wrong at the last minute. <laughs> Something he realized that he hadn't got. He hadn't got the key. That's why he called that out. Why else would he call it out? But anyway, uh, this particular teacher, this was when I was, as I said, nine or ten, he was furious. Absolutely furious. He said, you don't ask such questions. And I was made to go and stand in the corridor. I don't know. <laughs> ah. <laughs> but it stuck. I'm thankful to him because it stuck in my, I was going to say gullet, in my guts. It really did. I never forgot that incident. I was so upset because I thought my question was a reasonable one. And I never forgot it, and I suppose in a way that was the beginning, you know, of opening up my seeking mind. So I have to be thankful to that particular teacher for what he did. And in the end, I understood. Of course that was true. The last moment of his life, Jesus Christ, who was a great person, a great bodhisattva in terms of Buddhism, realized that he hadn't quite yet got the answer. The ultimate truth. That's why he called that out in his agony from the cross. And however much anyone who practices Christianity tries to change my mind, I never would believe it. The reality is there in those agonized words, isn't it? So please, in telling you this experience, I don't want you to go talking to Christians like that. <laughs> no, I really mean that very seriously. Never should you deride someone else's religion. Never, absolutely never, but you can gradually make them understand that maybe...